It's the summer garden tips and tour. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog. And I'm in Kent, South East England, which I usually say roughly equates to a USDA hardiness zone of nine because our winters are so mild. But of course, our summers are not as hot. We've been averaging 20 degrees Celsius for the last few weeks, and that's maybe 22, 25 on a hot day, and that really isn't very hot. But if you're a temperate zone gardener, and that's really the USDA zones five to 10, it's the UK, it's Northern Europe, it's many parts of Canada, and the southernmost tips of Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand, then actually we're growing many of the same plants. And it's now in summer that we're actually doing very much of the same things to them. It's in winter that the huge differences in our gardens become apparent. So at the moment, I would say that this is really about deadheading and watering. I'll put links to any resources I mention in the description below. And if you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. Deadheading is the simplest gardening technique. It's really just chopping off the dead or dying flowers. And if you do that, the chances are that your garden will be fuller of flowers for longer than if you don't do it. And the reason for that is that when the flower dies, the plant puts a lot of effort into creating a seed. But of course, if you cut off that dead flower, it puts a lot of effort into creating another flower. Not all plants repeat flower in the same year. So it may be that you'll get more flowers that year, or you may just get better flowers the following year. However, there are a few flowers that actually you either don't have to deadhead or it would be better if you didn't. And I'll just show you in my garden what those are. The middle sized garden is a walled town garden and it's 100 feet long and 80 feet wide at its widest. And because it's L shaped, it's 40 feet wide nearer the house. So if I look at the hydrangeas, here is Hydrangea Annabelle, absolutely at her best. I'm not going to deadhead her because those flowers will dry on the stem and they will be a lovely sculptural presence and look brilliant in frost in winter. The red flowers are Crocosmias and I'm not going to deadhead those because I like them to self-seed. So if there are plants that you want to self-seed, don't deadhead them because the seeds will scatter around the garden. The Crocosmias can sometimes be a bit invasive, so if you're going to grow them, then check whether they're invasive near you. But round here, all I have to do is to pull out the ones I don't want. Along this border, and also in the main border, is also something called Rosa Glauca. Rosa Glauca has lovely little pretty pink flowers, and they turn into really lovely red hips. So if there are roses that you want for their hips, then don't deadhead those either. Going along the back wall, there is, at the moment, the absolute best thing there is the Acanthus mollis ruler dan. This is the white variety, and it's less invasive than the one that's got slight purple tips. So once again, check for invasiveness near you, and um, if possible, try and get this pure white variety, which has been here for about 10 years and has only spread as much as you can see and hasn't spread anywhere else in the garden. And looking at the main border, I won't be deadheading the Verbena bonariensis either. These lovely, spiky, sculptural, airy, blue flowers have seeds in the winter and the birds love the seeds, but also they can be really beautiful in frost. So having gone around the garden and said these are the plants I'm not deadheading, then what are the ones I do and how to do it? I interviewed Neil Miller about how to grow roses. Neil is the head gardener of Hever Castle Gardens and they've got award-winning rose gardens. And he told me how to deadhead roses. And it depends on what kind of a rose you have. But you don't have to have kept the label or to be knowledgeable about roses. You just look at it. If you've got a rose with a single flower at the top of the stem, you snip that off at the nearest leaf junction. We always used to be told that it needed to be a leaf junction with five little leaflets rather than three. But Neil doesn't think that matters. If, on the other hand, your rose has lots of flowers clustering together at the end of the stem, then snip off the flowers as they go over to reveal the ones that are yet to come out. And when the whole head is over, cut the whole stem by half. These roses that cluster together at the end of the stem are called floribundas. And of course, if you've got a row of floribundas, it's sometimes simply not practical to deadhead them in that way. I've got this row of little pet floribunda roses. There's literally thousands of flowers on it. I couldn't possibly either deadhead them singly or even really a bunch at a time. There've been quite a lot of research to show that you can use shears or even strimmers on roses and that they will still reflower. So with this row of roses, I actually use secateurs and pruned quite carefully to deadhead them. 
for one half and the other half I used shears and both halves flowered again. They both flowered again for as long but there was a difference in that the ones that I used the secateurs on and that I'd done much more careful sort of deadheading and pruning came back earlier but then of course they were over earlier and the others came back later and they were over later. So I think it's a question of what you prefer and how much time you've got. You can probably see that the leaves are beginning to look a bit dodgy at the moment. My rose foliage is usually great in spring and early summer, but by midsummer, late summer, there's often a lot of black spot and some of the leaves are beginning to get a little bit sparse. I'm not too bothered by black spot myself and I don't use chemicals, so I'm just leaving it. But I recently visited Sarah Raven, who is a plant grower and seller who has a fantastic sense of colour. She has wonderful collections of tulips and dahlias, so do check out her website. And she said that she has been experimenting by growing salvias with roses. And the extremely strong smell of salvias seems to discourage the fungal infections of black spot. So I will give that a try next year. In terms of deadheading some of the other plants, the ones that repeat flower are the ones you want to deadhead. So that's things like cosmos and dahlias and alchemilla mollis. So when it comes to deadheading these sort of plants, it's a good idea if you can snip them off nearest the leaf junction. But in the end, if you can't reach into the border and really get, get at them, just get the head off. It really is more important to deadhead than it is to deadhead properly and carefully. So how often should you deadhead? I interviewed Francis Moskowitz for a video called How to Make a Herbaceous Border Look Amazing, and I'll put that in the description below. And Francis deadheads four times a day, and I'm just never going to get around to that. But I did very much take her tip about keeping a pair of snippers by the back door, another one in the potting shed, and really anywhere that's convenient to leave them, so that every time you pop into the garden, you can just go snip, snip, snip. And I've certainly deadheaded a lot more since I spoke to her. I've used snips or snippers and I've bought the brand that she suggested and I'll put a link to that in the description below. But you can use secateurs and you can use scissors, although I find scissors sometimes a bit difficult for thicker stems. So while I'm talking about cosmos, one of the things Sarah Raven also said was that she always pinches out her cosmos. If you're growing cosmos from seed, then when it gets to the point where it's got two or even three sets of real leaves, you pinch it down, you effectively cut it in half, you just pinch it down so that you're left with just the lower set of leaves or even the lower two sets of leaves. And so I put this on Instagram and quite a few professional gardeners said yes that's what I do and then one person came on and said what stupid advice and seemed very cross about it and I thought well that's a bit extreme for pinching cosmos but anyway let's find out what's behind it. So I asked several more professional head gardeners whether they pinched out their cosmos and they all looked a bit surprised and said, well, yes, of course. And then I asked a flower farmer if she pinched out her cosmos, Sue Oriel of Country Lane Flowers. And she said, no, no, I never pinch out my cosmos because what I want is the flowers to be as big as possible and to have as long a stem as possible. And of course, what we want for our borders is to have the cosmos bushy so that it stands up well. I don't need the flowers to be big, I just need lots of them. And pinching out makes the plants a little bit shorter, more bushy, and you may have smaller flowers and you'll probably have more of them. So pinching out really works for a border, but if you're growing flowers for cut flowers, you may not want to pinch out. So once again, this is about what you want from your garden. Another plant which you deadhead is Alchemilla mollis. Now we're growing Alchemilla mollis amongst the pavers on our terrace. And we've got quite a few weeds and alchemilla mollis between the pavers. And we're slowly trying to take out the ones we don't want to allow the ones we do want to flourish. Because actually I think pavers with erigeron and alchemilla mollis and wild violet look lovely. And I always love it when I see it in people's houses. But there are certain weeds I don't want between my pavers. I think it's taking a while for the ones we do want to take over. So it's an ongoing experiment, but this is where we've got to now. And I think generally people have much more tolerance of weeds. There are some plants that you are effectively deadheading, but it's usually not referred to as deadheading. And that is things that you chop back after they've flowered. And some flower again, like Campanula, and I've just chopped back this Campanula with shears, and it should flower again in about four to six weeks. And there are others that don't flower again, but you do need to chop them back in order to keep the plant compact 
and have the best flowering next year. And of course, one of these is lavender. We've had this lavender here for 11 years and we've always cut it back really hard, as I've often said in a couple of other videos, which I will put in the description below. And that has kept the lavender compact and neat and coming back year after year. But this year, it really has got too big and too woody and you can barely walk through the path. And a garden has to work on a functional level as well as a beautiful level. I love the way this looks. And we recently opened our garden for Faversham Open Gardens. And I noticed that people were walking round the lavender rather than through the path. So much as I love this, I'm afraid it's going to have to go once the flowers are over. I've got the other garden tips and tours for other times of the year in a playlist at the end of this video. And do tell me how you're finding your summer gardens, especially if you're in very different climate conditions from me. Are you doing the same thing or not? I don't know. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.